Hello, BookTube. The guys at Strip Cover Lit did their third video read-along of J.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, and since I, I don't like to miss an opportunity to talk about Tolkien, I, uh, I'm making a video right along with them. Uh, the, the, uh, and I thought, as usual, first we would start with the story so far, a sort of plot summary. Uh, up until now, uh, Frodo Baggins has come into possession through his cousin Bilbo of a magic ring that makes its bearer invisible. Uh, the researches of Gandalf the wizard convince him that the ring is much more than just a magic trinket, that it is in fact the one ring, a, a malevolent creation of the Dark Lord Sauron, who rules in the far east of Middle-earth, uh, that was lost, has been lost for millennia, and is now found again, and Sauron knows it and is searching for it uh, to complete his power. And since this makes it a danger, Frodo decides to leave his home in the Shire, uh, far to the west of Middle-earth, and travel to Rivendell, uh, a, a home and citadel of the High Elves on Middle-earth, ruled by Elrond, in the hopes that they will be able be better equipped to help him deal with this thing. And three of his friends go with him, Sam, Merry, and Pippin, all fellow hobbits. Uh, they encounter many dangers on the road, and they encounter some help as well. Uh, and one of the people who helps them is a, a man named Strider, who turns out to be, his real name turns out to be Aragorn, and he is a Dunedain. He is a ranger. He is a, uh, one of the last remnants of an ancient and mighty race of man, uh, that now wander in the wilderness seemingly at random. Uh, and he helps them to get to Rivendell. And right before they reach Rivendell, they gain help from, as well, from a, a mighty elf lord named Glorfindel. And Frodo is injured, but he recovers. Elrond saves him. And so the, the section that we're reading now, uh, the next six chapters that we're reading now, starts with Frodo and his friends safely arrived in Rivendell and immediately broadens into a chapter called the Council of Elrond in which Elrond calls together not only the most powerful members of his own house but guests who have arrived at Rivendell as he puts it I didn't summon anyone but they fate made them come anyway uh, there are representatives from the dwarves there are representatives from the elves of Mirkwood uh, there are men not only Aragon uh, but also uh, representatives of Gondor, a mighty kingdom down in the south. Uh, and there's Gandalf, who had gone missing for the beginning of the book, but turns up in, in Rivendell safe and sound. <laughs> uh, and the chapter, the Council of Elrond, in that chapter, which is, in my opinion, one of the greatest works of fictional exposition ever done, the only rival I can think of in science fiction and fantasy is the famous banquet scene at the beginning of Dune. Uh, and even that doesn't give you nearly as much information. And yet there's so much more than information dumping going on in this chapter. It's absolutely thrilling. Even though it's a bunch of people sitting around a table talking. Mainly because they take turns telling their own stories. And it becomes this, this patchwork tapestry of us figuring out the whole story of the ring. Elrond tells a great deal of it. He knows the history of the ring from the beginning. Uh, but everybody has a part. The, the, uh, the dwarves tell of messengers from, the, from Sauron's kingdom of Mordor coming with kind words, just barely covering threats and telling them, you know, a new order in the world is coming and you had better be prepared. Uh, and Boromir, a proud warrior man from Gondor, comes telling of dark prophetic dreams that he and his brother have had about halflings and magic swords and the end of the world as they know it. He, he's been told to come to Rivendell because Elrond has skill in divining things like that, and, and that's what he wants, help in understanding what's going to happen to his beloved kingdom. Uh, and the elves of Mirkwood come uh, in, in, the, in the person of Legolas, the son of Thranduil, the king of the elves of Mirkwood, comes with bad news. Gollum, the, the sickly creature who owned the ring forever and ever, for centuries, uh, was captured by Aragorn and given to the elves of Mirkwood 
to be kept imprisoned, kindly, but still confined, until such time as the the the, the the people of Middle-earth could figure out what to do with him, and the elves have come to tell everyone at Rivendell that he escaped. Uh, so that's bad news. <laughs> but they're all there. Uh, and Frodo, of course, has the ring. And Gandalf has a story to tell about how he came to know that the ring was, in fact, the One Ring, which involved consulting with Saruman, another wizard, the head of Gandalf's order. And Gandalf tells the story of how he met a yet a third wizard, Radagast, in, while he was wandering you know, in, in the west of Middle-earth, who told him that Saruman had sent a message for him to come to Saruman's uh, fortress at Orthanc right away so they can confer. But it turns out it's a trap. And when Gandalf gets there, Saruman imprisons him because Saruman has been brought under the sway of desire for the ring. Uh, for himself, he's he's obviously, although it's never it's never ex we're never explicitly told what's going on, but it becomes obvious that he is in league with Sauron, but that he's also playing his own game and would like the ring to come to him and not Sauron. Uh, very complex stuff, and all of it done. I mean, the Council of Elrond chapter is quite long, but still, all of it is done so quickly, so fleet-footedly, that you're it's the most effortless bring the reader up to speed that you could imagine and it's done very skillfully and the council of elrond be as i mentioned in my last video begins the book proper because it's in this chapter that the fellowship of the ring is forged where elrond and gandalf decide that the only thing that will save middle earth from the ongoing peril of this ring is to destroy it and there's only one way to destroy it and that is in mount doom in the volcanic fissures of Mount Doom, in the heart of Sauron's own kingdom. Which, of course, is impregnable. So there's no sense sending an army. There isn't an army left in Middle-earth that can, that can force the gates of Mordor. So instead, they decide to send a company of walkers, nine walkers, to match the nine riders who are the chief servants of Sauron. Uh, and that company is Frodo, Sam, Merry and Pippin, the four hobbits, Aragorn, Boromir from Gondor, Legolas from the Elves, and Gimli, son of Glowen, one of the one of the dwarfs who accompanied Bilbo on his original adventure in The Hobbit. Uh, and these nine set off from Rivendell with a plan to go south secretly. And their original plan is to cross the Misty Mountains at the Pass of Caradras. But becomes impossible. The, the, the winter weather is so fierce, so horrible in the upper passes that uh, not only is it, is, or is it impassable essentially to anyone, but also it doesn't seem natural. Uh, and uh, there's actually, uh, Aragon actually makes a point uh, that I wanted to read you about that when they're talking about how unnatural it seems. Aragon says, uh, I do not call it the wind, uh, but that does not make what you say untrue. There are many evil and unfriendly things in the world that have little love for those that go on two legs, and yet they are not in league with Sauron, but have purposes of their own. Some have been in this world longer than he. Uh, it, it becomes the decision of the company that they are facing such creatures and that it would be suicide to go on. And the only other alternative, if you can't go over the mountain, is to go under the mountain. It's an alternative that, that Aragorn has argued against with Gandalf. We don't see that argument. We don't hear it. In a, in a less assured fantasy novel, we would. We'd get every single point and counterpoint. Instead, we just know that the two of them, who are the de facto leaders of this fellowship, have been arguing over the right course to take. Aragorn's arguing that they try the Caradros Pass, and Gandalf suggesting that they try something else, that they try making their way through the old abandoned dwarf kingdom of Moria, which lies underneath the Misty Mountains, and which is rumored to be the home of orcs, and maybe worse than orcs, of horrible evils. A dark and treacherous path. Uh, but they have no choice, so they decide to take that path. There's actually a wonderful scene where they encounter a dwarf-forged gate, a doorway, that's 
closed and seemingly locked. Uh, it's a great scene. It's a classic Tolkien having fun with language. Uh, but eventually they make their way into Moria and down into the depths of it where they encounter the tomb of Balin, one of the dwarfs from The Hobbit who went to Moria in order to reclaim it for the dwarfs. The, the, the hope of Gimli and his father and their fellow dwarfs was that Balin might still be alive, that there might actually be still a holdout colony of dwarfs in Moria, but no, Balin is dead. They're all dead. And uh, the same fate very nearly reaches our company. They, uh, they awaken the orcs who are infesting the depths of Moria and have to fight their way out. And as they're making their way towards the upper air and the outside world, they realize that the orcs in Moria have an ally, a horrible ally, a Balrog, a giant creature of darkness and flame that is that is, the orcs are terrified of, and it wants to destroy them, wants to destroy the Fellowship. And as Gandalf puts it, swords are of no more use here. There's nothing you can that arrows and swords can do against it gigantic creature from the old world uh, it's only Gandalf who can stop the thing and so the others cross a narrow bridge and are on their way out Gandalf turns to hold the bridge against the Balrog telling it that he is the wielder of the secret fire of Arnor and that the creature cannot pass and looks like it's going to work Gandalf breaks the bridge underneath the creature and it plunges into the depths and just as we think that the danger has passed, the Balrog's whip slices up from below, grips Gandalf by the knees, and pulls him down into the abyss. And that's it. <laughs> that's the, that's where our uh, that's where our chapter, the chapter is the bridge at Khazad-dûm, and that's where it ends, with the company fleeing Moria into the sunlight, but without their leader. Uh, and that's where our reading stops for now, and I wanted to point out a couple of things, uh, the first of which is something I mentioned before, which is that in this chapter, the register of the book changes completely. Tolkien adopts a completely new diction that he will not abandon for the rest of the book. We get, like, for instance, at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the book when we're being told about the characters, like, for instance, Glorfindel, who we've met before, uh, the description is, Glorfindel was tall and straight, his hair was shining gold, his face fair and young and fearless and full of joy, his eyes were bright and keen, his voice like music, on his brow sat wisdom, and in his hand was strength. Isn't how, how intentionally antique that sounds? The four adjectives in a row it has a biblical cadence to it. You've got the young and fearless and fair and full of joy, and the, the lines, his... <clears throat> Uh, his brow on his brow sat wisdom and his hand was strength uh, again a very intentionally old-fashioned and also grand way of putting things uh, that doesn't exist earlier in the book uh, and the same thing is true with I believe that not only not only is the uh, the diction better but also uh, it's more dramatically intense all of it is uh, like for instance when Boromir from Gondor is complaining that Gondor holds the line against the the attacks of Sauron and, is, and gets little thanks for it, uh, Aragorn has uh, an earful <laughs> to give him. One of my favorite passages in the in the Council of Elrond, uh, where he tells him, if Gondor if Gondor Boromir has a, has been a stalwart tower, we the Dunedain uh, have played another part. Many evil things there are that the your strong walls and bright swords do not stay. You know little. Uh, you know little of the lands beyond your bounds. Peace and freedom, do you say? The North would have known little of them but for us. Fear would have destroyed them. But when dark things come from houseless hills and creep from sunless woods, they fly from us. What roads would any dare to tread? What safety would there be in quiet lands or in the homes of simple men at night if the Dunedain were all asleep or gone into their grave? And yet less thanks have we than you. Travelers scowl at us, and countrymen give us scornful names. Strider am I to one fat man who lives within a day's march of foes that would his, freeze his blood, or lay his little town in ruin if he were not guarded ceaselessly. Yet we would not have it otherwise. If simple folk are free from care and fear, simple they will be, and we must be secret to keep them so. That has been the task of my kindred while the years have lengthened and the grass has grown. Uh, and... 
Uh, the council also mentions a character that we've seen that we saw the last time, Tom Bombadil, uh, because Elrond is amazed to hear the reports of this character. He remembers Bombadil from ages ago, and wonders if maybe he should have come to the council. Gandalf says he wouldn't have come, and he might take the ring if all the free people of Middle Earth begged him to do so. But he wouldn't know what the importance was, and would be a careless guardian of it. Uh, and one of the High Elves says that there's no power to fight Sauron in Tom Bombadil. There's only, he, he controls the land where he is, but even if he had the ring, if all the rest of Middle-earth turned against him, he would fall, last as he was first. Uh, no, the plan is to, is to uh, destroy the ring. Uh, and so the, the characters set off, and that's my other point, the point that's always bothered me about this chapter. Uh, the decision on Elrond's part, that the nine riders of the ring rates of the, the servants of Sauron will be matched by nine walkers by a company of nine people who will take the ring to to Mount Doom isn't a realistic decision it's not a decision that a character in a book would make it's a character it's a decision that a writer of a book would make it's the kind of of symmetry that writers like but the real world characters don't like uh, at first when the fellowship is being chosen uh, Elrond is surprised when Merry and Pippin say that they're going. They say, if you, if you don't let us go, you'll have to tie us up in gunny sacks because we're, we're, company, we're accompanying our friends. And that seems to sway both Elrond and Gandalf. And that's crazy. <laughs> that's a novelistic thing to do. In, if, if this were a real story, if the characters are behaving in real believable ways, We've already been told that characters like Galdor or Arrestor or Glorfindel have the power all by themselves to ride against the Nine Riders alone. And not only that, but Aragorn knows other Dunedain, he knows other rangers like himself, other members of, of the, the last blood of Westerness, and dwarves are incredibly hardy, fanatical warriors and Legolas isn't the only person to arrive from the Mirkwood <laughs> it makes no and not only that it makes no sense that that those three spots Sam Mary and Pippin three useless hobbits would it makes no sense that if you want the ring to get where it's going even if you're not trying to force Mortar by force of arms you would put powerful useful people in those three positions instead of three young hobbits <laughs> and that's not even counting the fact that nowhere in the book is it even considered that maybe radagast the other wizard <laughs> might be asked to join the group <laughs> saruman has nothing but contempt for radagast but radagast the fool radagast the bird tamer radagast the brown but nevertheless, the man's a wizard. <laughs> he can speak to animals, and he knows what else he can do. And not only is he not invited, but Gandalf doesn't even think to invite him. That's, that's insane. To, a, a, a group, a fellowship that has two wizards in it instead of one is better than one with only one wizard. <laughs> that's always bothered me, that, that that decision is made, and the symmetry of rider versus walker is considered more important than maybe sending 15 people in the Fellowship of the Ring, even if you've got to include the Hobbits. Send three High Elf, you know, three High Elves who are centuries old and have all sorts of skills and abilities that, to fight off the enemies you are certainly going to encounter. Uh, but it's a minor, it's a minor quibble. <laughs> my main, my main uh, joy in rereading this was just how wonderful it all is, how the whole thing goes from uh, a meandering beginning to bolting action and and epic diction and epic stakes and uh and a tragic ending uh, the, the these six chapters are incredibly effective and uh the guys will be doing their next video on the last six chapters of the fellowship of the ring and i'll be right there with them and then we have a decision to make it's pretty clear from their videos that they aren't going to be doing the two towers and i'll need to know if i get to do you, the rest of you want to see me go on with the rest of Lord of the Rings. I'm happy to do it if you do. I'll just keep going six chapters at a time. Uh, but if you'd rather stop, if you like the the the, uh, the fellowship right where it is, just let me know. <laughs> anyway, sorry again for the length of the video. I'll, I'll see you soon, book two.